Hello and welcome to the Tough Girl Podcast, which is all about motivating and inspiring you. I'm your host, Sarah Williams. The Tough Girl Podcast is sponsorship and ad-free thanks to the monthly financial support of patrons. To find out more about supporting the Tough Girl Podcast, please visit Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Tough Girl Podcast and help me to increase the amount of female role models in the media. All patrons will get their name on a dedicated patrons page on the Tough Girl website. All female patrons, $5 and above, are invited to join the closed Facebook group, The Tough Girl Tribe. New episodes go live every Tuesday at 7 a.m. UK time, so make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out. Today, I'm delighted we're going to be speaking with Kirsty Palace, who is a mixed race, freelance, mountaineering, and climbing instructor from the west coast of Scotland. Kirsty is the founder of Our Shared Outdoors, an organisation set up to tackle and change the lack of diversity in the outdoors and promote underrepresented groups. She's really passionate about making outdoor communities as accessible as possible to everybody, because it should be. Kirsty is also a panelist on the Outside podcast where they discuss outdoor news in the UK with a panel of diverse outdoor enthusiasts. And now let's speak with Kirsty. So I'm a mountaineering and climbing instructor and winter mountain leader based in Auburn, which is on the west coast of Scotland. I've been an outdoor instructor for over 10 years. I'm in the Open Mountain Rescue as well. I joined there in 2013 and I'm one of the call out managers. I'm also one of the founding members of Our Shared Outdoors, which is an organisation looking to increase the diversity and reduce barriers to access in the outdoors. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about your childhood. Did you grow up in Scotland? So we moved as a family up to Oban when I was nine. Before that, we were from just I was from just outside of Leeds. So I kind of did the last part of primary school and all of high school in Oban. So that is, is where I count home. And were you quite so sporty and outdoorsy? Were you spending time in like the Scottish Highlands and outside um, in the mountains? Yeah, so I wasn't particularly like team sporty. Not at all, in fact. Like, PE was not my strong suit. But in terms of being outdoors, yeah. Our parents would always take us out on weekends and whenever we went on holidays, it was usually, like, somewhere else in Scotland. So, like, Sky or Ardemarkin, and we'd be going walking and exploring and, and all that kind of stuff. Oh, lovely. And what were your dreams when you were a little girl? Did you know that you wanted to work in sort of mountain rescue and become like an outdoor instructor? You know, how did that come about? So not at all when I was younger. I had lots of ideas, but I generally saw myself like carrying on with education, going to uni or whatever. But I did my work experience at an outdoor centre here in Oban that I'd been to as like a, a P7 or a a year six you have like a, a trip away before you go to high school and I was like for work experience I was like oh I'll just go it'll be a, be a fun week like just do it before I have to think about uni applications and stuff and then I had such a great week that I then went back just to volunteer for a few weeks during the summer holidays that year and I was like oh oh this is actually a job this is a job that you can do <laughs> so from then like I finished school, fairly academic in school, but was pretty decided that I didn't want to continue to uni after that. And then got a, an outdoor ed apprenticeship locally in Open with another organisation. And um, yeah, it all just kind of went from there. Well, what did you do in your apprenticeship? Uh, so we would shadow instructors and go on to become lead groups in like gorge walking, co-steering, canyoning, uh, rock climbing. We did some canoeing and sea kayak and stuff as well. But it was like in the apprenticeship, we got SVQs in outdoor education, so like a vocational qualification, as well as time training with a senior instructor who took us out and got us started on in winter skills and winter mountaineering and things like that. Did you have to do your like your summer mountain leader and, and th- those types of qualifications? Yes. So I didn't do it while I was an apprentice. I did my training while I was an apprentice and then got the assessment once I'd left. But we did a few other courses like your three-star sea kayak or level, 
I don't know what it's equivalent to now because it's changed quite a bit, but there's like a level one paddle sports coach and I'm trying to think, I'm sure we got some others, a few other bits and pieces like that. And then, yeah, once I'd left, went on to kind of mountain leader and it's now rock climbing instructor or a single pitch award when I did it. Were there many other women doing these qualifications and becoming, you know, summer and winter mountain leader when you were getting your qualifications? I think I had a slightly skewed perspective because when I was going, when I was on my apprenticeship, the other apprentice was another woman and we'd kind of gone to school together. She was a year older than me. So we did quite a lot together. And I think that was just by chance. But then when we went on to do some of the courses at like, national training centers or various course providers that's when you kind of noticed the difference and on my ml assessment i was the only woman and there's been yeah there's been a few other courses where you're kind of guaranteed a bedroom to yourself because you're the only woman <laughs> <laughs> what do you love about your, your job and the, and the role that you do i really love being able to pass on how much I enjoy it and how much enjoyment you can get out of being outdoors and whether that's hill walking or or learning skills to go climbing or winter skills or whatever I think all of these skills they give you like a vehicle to get into places that you maybe wouldn't before and I really enjoy kind of teaching and like yeah teaching people how to become independent in these environments you know sometimes when when you love your work you know it's like your passion it's your hobby but it's also like your full-time job do you still get that same sense of enjoyment from the outdoors bearing in mind that it is your it it is your job you do it full-time yeah I do I mean if I've been out working all week I'll sometimes be I feel quite tired by the weekend (laughs) and you know, if it's good weather, I'll still go out, but um, I'm quite content to stay inside when it's rainy. <laughs> Whereas, you know, folk who maybe have office jobs or like jobs that aren't in the outdoors would head out. But yeah, I do. I do really enjoy it. Tell me more about deciding to join the mountain rescue team. How did that come about? So they had a bit of a recruitment drive and I, I think at the time I was just finishing up my apprenticeship. And I kind of knew some of the folk in the team and they encouraged me to come along to some trainings and see see what I thought. I think if I hadn't known anyone, I'm not sure I would have gone because I, th- I think I probably would have thought that I wasn't like at the right level too. So it was by being encouraged to come along that I kind of was like, oh, maybe I can. So I went along to the first couple of training sessions and I was like, oh, this is amazing such a cool team of people it's like the open team is super supportive yeah and it just kind of went from there and now it's like eight years later (laughs) what's your role in the team you mentioned that you were the call out manager How, how does that work what do you do we have like kind of six or seven call out managers and we rotate roughly on a weekly basis so we'll be on call for a week and it just means if a if a shout or a call out comes in, whoever's on call is the person managing that shout. So so that job is like sending the message out to the rest of the team, figuring out who's available, and then coming up with a plan of how we're going to deal with the call out. Like where do people need to be? What equipment do we need? You know, are we going to need other agencies? Like is a, are we going to need a helicopter? Are we going to need to call out other teams or search dogs? It's kind of the person who is managing the whole shout and has an overview of everything that's going on and is making the decisions. Most of the time, like not alone, you know, you'll kind of, if it's a big decision, you'll bounce it off someone and just make sure that it's, you're doing the best you can. Are the rescues quite stressful? They can be. It depends. It depends what you've got. You know, sometimes you'll get enough information to know that, you know, maybe somebody's injured their ankle, they're warm, so they've got equipment, so they're warm and they're dry. Like, you know, they're not going to be comfortable, but you've got time to get to them. So those kinds of rescues 
you know, you're going, you know what you're going to get when you get there. And it's relatively straightforward. I mean, not always. But then there's others where you might not have that much information. You know, someone's phone batteries died. You don't know exactly where they are. You don't know if there's injuries or what those injuries could be. Like, is it a life-threatening situation? And I think in those call-outs, it's maybe... I mean, it is it is stress, but it's mostly like adrenaline based. You know that somebody needs your help. You just got to go. Yeah, and is this a volunteer role or is this a paid role? So it's all all completely voluntary for all the teams in the UK, other than like police or RAF teams. Um, but all the civilian teams are voluntary. So, so yeah, we you never really know like how how much time is going to be required you don't know what the call outs are going to be yeah it can be it can be quite a lot but it's you know if i'm working there's a bit of an understanding in the team that not everyone's going to be able to make every call out you know people have other things as well yeah with covid last year and this year and you know more people being stuck at home and you know more people possibly heading out into the outdoors because they haven't been able to go on their normal type of holidays have you noticed an a sort, of, sort of an, an upkick in the amount of rescues that you've been having to get involved in yeah there has been a few more I think we're not like a super busy area so in places like Glencoe and Loch Arbor, I think they've really been hit by it more than we have but yeah we have we have been dealing with a few more call outs yeah, like COVID has just added an extra layer that we need to be aware of as well when we're dealing with them and heading out. And I suppose, you know, when you're when you're chatting with the team, you know, or maybe, yeah, talking about the, the different types of rescues that you've been on, what are the things that you'd like the public to know? What's, what am I trying to ask you? Like, yeah, like, how, what, <laughs> like almost like what advice would you want people who are heading out into the mountains to know? Like, how can they not need to be rescued if that makes sense (laughs) yeah yeah it does I think um yeah you want you want people to be as prepared as possible so you know having a few extra layers in your bag a warm drink having suitable footwear having waterproofs all that kind of stuff is probably the the best advice we can give but I think something that is worth saying is that if you do need rescued, like we we volunteer because we want to, you know, like don't not call us out because that can usually, well, it can sometimes end in something worse if someone is stuck or if they are injured. We're there to be called out and, and we do it because we are also mountain people and mountaineers and we understand why people want to be out. You mentioned at the start that you're one of the founders of Our Shared Outdoors, and I'd love for you to share more about the organisation and how it came about and how you became a founder. It kind of came about after a few conversations last year. I mean, last June, you know, everyone knows there was a big uprise in Black Lives Matter, and, and I think everyone taking a look at what they could do to make their spaces more welcoming so there's a few conversations from that and it kind of evolved from there so it's a there's a group of us a kind of people that we knew and people got in touch with social media so it's it's been really nice getting to know lots of people who are also passionate in the same area um and we're we're just registering as a a charity in scotland um and our our kind of aim is to kind of break down some of those barriers to access Something we're really keen on is that we're not just looking at one underrepresented group, but, you know, everyone that's been historically excluded from the outdoors, whether that's women or people of colour or LGBTQ plus folk or disabled people, just anyone who feels like they don't belong in the outdoors. We want to kind of try and change the narrative around that. So, yeah kind of an overview (laughs) so how are you changing the narrative what are you doing specifically so far we've kind of started on social media and we've been putting out some educational posts 
but we are in the process of setting up some film events that will focus on sharing stories from underrepresented communities. We're also setting up a mentorship scheme and identifying areas of funding and then providing support for writing the funding applications to people. And we also want to kind of almost lobby some brands and organisations and governing bodies that are maybe not doing enough. You were also in, involved in a film as well, which is sort of linked into this, which was um, released on the BMC TV. Uh, is, it, is it called Call to the Mountains? Yes, it is. Yeah, Call to the Mountains. Would you like to share more about, about that film and um, how it came about and what the lessons were from that? Yeah, it was filmed in January 2020. I never expected it to turn into what it is. So it came about because the filmmakers are friends of friends from London coming up and they wanted to film a couple of like documentary style films for their portfolio. They're just kind of starting up as a, a new company. So yeah, so I, I said I was happy to get involved and we filmed it over about a day and a half. So if you've not seen it, there's bits on the hill, practicing some winter skills in Glencoe, and then a little bit of a mountain rescue training as well. And I guess it was just like a bit of a snapshot of my life and kind of what I do and where I've come from. I don't really know much about films or anything, so I was quite happy to be led by them about what they wanted to feature. And I think they've really pulled together something quite special and it's yeah it's like it's all the all the nice bits <laughs> <laughs> amazing so people can, can people watch that on youtube yeah so it's on youtube on the team bmc youtube channel i also uploaded it onto my instagram as well so it's there too oh fantastic i'll make sure i put the link so that people can watch the film because how, how long is it it's not that long is it no, it's just, it's eight minutes. Eight minutes, perfect. I will definitely share the link so that people can watch that. Who are your role models? Who are the women that inspire you? The people that inspired me are probably instructors that have, so the Winter Mountaineering and Climate Instructor Award, which is kind of where where I'm headed next. And I've known about some folks that have had them for a while so Sam Leary she's based in North Wales she's amazing very humble I'm not sure she's happy with me always calling her out as being a role model <laughs> but she she did my winter ML training and she's just so so ace just so great and then Lou Reynolds she's currently on the British guide scheme and she she had her winter mountaineering and climbing instructor award when she was like 23 or 24, really young. She absolutely flew through it. And again, just just amazing. And then there's loads of other women I know that are amazing instructors. So Rachel Crewsmith and then Jenny Dart, who I went through, I kind of, we went through our MCI journey at a similar time. So I think just kind of being part of that community is what really inspires me. I don't really look to like professional climbers or anything because for me that's absolutely not achievable <laughs> I like seeing people that are at a similar level to me or like just a step up from where I want to be and just absolutely smashing it yeah what advice would you have for women who want to start doing their qualifications in you know the summer mountain leader or the winter mountain leader or the international mountain leader from your experience what is what would be your top advice and top tips for other women it sounds tricky but like you just need to get on and do it because the reality is you're likely to be one of few women at the moment but unless we go out and do it that's never going to change there are some folk who run women only courses so if that is something you'd be more comfortable with, then absolutely like go and search them out. But I think for the time being, we just have to know that we're probably going to still be one of a few women. And for that to change, we need to be there. We need to be the role models. 
so we have to go and do it and by all means like if you're on a training course or an assessment course and there's something somebody says something you know there's a bit of casual sexism sexism or whatever like call it out use it as a teaching moment even if it doesn't make a difference to that person it might make a difference to somebody who was in the group and maybe they'll go on and call out something later on down the line I think we just have to be there doing it now you also you also uh, I know you're you're a very busy lady because you're also a panelist <laughs> on on the outside podcast. Would you like to share yeah. more more about uh, the about the podcast, what it is, what sort of topics you talk about? So yes, yeah, it's, it's still a relatively new podcast. It's in its first season, but it's a a kind of panel show talking about outdoor news that's relevant to the UK because I think a, there's quite a few kind of outdoor podcasts that are more US based but I think we've got a slightly different environment in the UK and it's a it's a really great panel there's loads of really cool folk coming from lots of different backgrounds and different opinions and different sports so yeah we discuss whatever it might be that's come up so um like we spoke about Afghanistan and how everything that's going on over there has affected the women that were in sport We've spoken about like the dis- gender disparity in mountain bike races. We've spoken about, um, I'm trying to think what else there's been, stuff like climate change based stuff and how as outdoor enthusiasts we can think about our impact, new kind of cycle routes or, or long distance walks. So yeah, just kind of like topics that should be discussed and and maybe areas that people should be more aware of as well what are your topics that you like discussing that you like bringing to people's attention I think for me I do I do like everyone I live with knows I I like ranting about like disparities you know unequal access what's affecting it how we can change it things that I see that are like maybe taking things back a step that some people might not realize are doing that so for me the outdoors is like my life it's the most incredible place so I just want it to be as available to everyone as it is to me so doing anything I can in that way and like bringing those kinds of stories up yeah through you know mixing with with different people and having these different conversations and from your different viewpoints of being in the mountains for the past 10 years and also working on the mountain rescue team um, for, for many years as well. You know, what have you noticed have been some of the the bigger barriers that stop people from going outdoors? And then what advice would you have to, to help people overcome, go round, go under, go through those barriers? There's kind of like a mix of physical barriers and then other ones that are more like based on what we perceive. So I think the a really big barrier is basically when we look at films, advertising, like brand models, brand athletes, we tend to see like one type of person. You know, they're usually white, they're usually blonde, fit, they're <laughs> slim. Yeah, 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 like blonde hair, blue eyes, just like striding around or climbing really hard or whatever. And I think that, gives a really one-sided image to the outdoors and unfortunately like until those kinds of things change that's not really a barrier we can take away other than like going onto places like Instagram and just trying to find role models that are different I think that's it like you just want to try and find people that you can relate to and Instagram's a really great place for that or whatever social media you prefer So that would be one area. I think another area that I certainly struggle with is like equipment. Um, Like I'm five foot, so I'm pretty tiny. (laughs) I was waiting for more. I was waiting for like I'm five foot something. (laughs) No, no, no. I'm just five foot, so pretty pretty tiny. And like there's some things that are just not made for me, like waterproof trousers. Can I ever get any short enough? I've actually found one pair now that are amazing. And then if I want like waterproofs that are going to stand up to like winter climbing 
is that ever going to be something that I can find? Who even knows? Like, I just have to accept that I have these little bags around my ankles and I have to walk a bit wider so my crampons don't catch on them. And like, I've got quite small hands as well. So finding really good winter gloves is really hard because I I've just have so much finger on the end of my gloves that I'm like trying to tie knots or like do a carabiner or whatever it is. I'm like, I've got all this useless glove. <laughs> um, so I think a kit is a big one and it's it's really tricky because it's a bit of a chicken and egg situation when I've spoken to places either brands or like shops that stock kit I kind of said like oh why don't you have a bigger women's selection and they kind of say oh there's not the demand for it but the problem is because there isn't a bigger women's section if a woman needs something then she might just have to buy something from the men's section so then we're missing out that actually there is demand but somebody's had to go go around that and so I don't really know how we sort that out yeah I mean actually it's an annoyance (laughs) god absolutely absolutely and also just going back to your point as well around the visibility the power of like representation being able to see role models who who look like you who are who, who, you know, who are five foot or they're five foot eight or they're different, you know, they're a different size, they're different, they're a different shape. It is so, so powerful. I mean, and the thing that I struggle with is, is I'm almost like so immersed in the the adventure world and my my social media feed is just so full of women, you know, going out, doing adventures and challenges and climbing mountains and getting their qualifications. But I actually, I feel as I don't know if that is a true reflection of what is happening or if I'm just, if my social media is so warped, but I just see such a large percentage that I think change has, has happened for, for the, for the better. I mean, have you noticed any changes over the past 10 years, whether there's more women and girls in in the mountains or more women who are going after their qualifications? Yeah, I would say in terms of participation levels, I think there has been a change. We are seeing more people out on the hills you know, it's not uncommon to see a woman wearing a hijab on the hills now, which is amazing. So we are in the participation side, we are seeing more. And I do think kind of social media has helped that. It's it's made people realise that maybe they wouldn't have thought about it before, but they're seeing these amazing pictures and they're like, oh, I want to see that. So I think that's that's really great. In terms of qualifications, I think that's going to take a while to feed through. Like the last couple of years, the number of female MCI, which is the mountaineering and climbing instructor, trainees was pretty high. It was like, I want to say like 12 or 14 at one point. And it got to the point, I was like, I don't think I know any guys that are trainees. But it turns out they just weren't weren't making themselves as obvious. <laughs> like I've kind of been following this the last few years. And to me, it felt like, there's loads more women coming through these awards. The kind of overall body for mountaineering instructors is the Association of Mountaineering Instructors. And I'm a member of the Equity and Diversity Working Group for them. And so for International Women's Day this year, I was like, right, this is great. I'm going to put a post together looking at how these statistics have changed. And I looked into it. And the association has been going for 30 years. And when it first started in whatever it was, 89, 90 or something like that. Um, There's like a 10% female membership. And I was like, great, all right, let's see where we at now, 2021. And we're still on a 10% female membership. And I was actually quite shocked about that. So basically, I think what's happened, there are more women going through these awards, but there's proportionally more men also going through these awards. So our overall percentage has, has just hasn't changed I saw like it's almost just like so like oh like and I'm I say try not to lose hope so it's like like no no we've got to stay positive stay encouraging you know to encourage more women to get the qualifications to to get outside you know to start evening up those those numbers because didn't the BMC didn't they start like a mentoring program specifically to encourage women to get their qualifications and wasn't there a little bit of uproar about that or something yeah there was yeah so uh it was mountain training that started it so it was I think 
probably 2015 they started it and it was initially just you know we want to see more women in these qualifications we're going to provide mentorship for women and I think basically that there wasn't a bit of a pushback and an uproar from guys saying oh but what if we want mentorship which is like it's a fair point you know some guys might be more comfortable if there's mentorship I think it was more just that it was it maybe wasn't announced or it felt like it was done a bit underhand which wasn't intentional at all so I think that's more where the pushback came from I mean from what I've heard like there's no they don't really separate the statistics by gender but in terms of like first pass statistics can't pass if you're a woman and I think it's just because you're less likely to wing it <laughs> um, you know they say that with like job interviews as well don't they that like women would only go for some that they can tick 100% of the kind of essential requirements whereas a guy will look at like 60% and be like oh yeah I can have this job so yeah I think women are more likely to pass first time but it maybe takes them a wee bit longer because of that and then I think this is where some of the disparity really comes in is if you've taken a bit longer to get to your MCI and then maybe you do want to think about your WMCI so your winter one but it's about that time women have to make the decision between having children and like continuing with their career and I think that's where we get some kind of loss in in the WMCI award yeah is there much support for women like if if they have children in terms of like maternity leave cover are you still able to to work I mean I suppose like even on like the mountain rescue team I suppose there must be a cut-off point of when you're not not allowed to probably for more like insurance purposes than anything else yeah so in terms of kind of maternity leave and cover like it just it depends on your employment status if you're employed you know that should be in place but if you're freelance then like that's where it gets tricky it's not like a job that you know like you can take a year off and come back to it because your body's gonna have changed but also like you get skill fade like it happens to all of us you know it's happened happened through lockdowns and stuff you get skill fade so it's gonna take time for you to get back to the level you were at and you've still got very young children at home and at that time you know like there might be peers that were guys have maybe progressed beyond you and you've maybe missed out on job opportunities because of that and I'm not sure if there's much way around that one or if it is just a barrier that you have to live with but yeah like there is a point when you're pregnant you know you can't wear a harness anymore it'd need to be like a full body harness and then can you like whatever be lay effectively or or whatever it is from that so I'm not really sure like when that comes in I suppose ev- everybody's different as well like when people pop yeah. and what their experience yeah. is and, and, and everything else yeah exactly there's exactly. no there's no one size fits all no definitely not so Kirsty, I'd love for you to share where can people find out more information about you where can they follow you online and where can they find more information about our shared outdoors I'm on Instagram I'm just at Kirsty Palace and then our shared outdoors we're on Instagram and Facebook and again it's just our shared outdoors fantastic and Kirsty, I'd love for you to share maybe one of your favorite walks favorite hikes um one of your favorite things to do up in Scotland so that if people I know more people are staying sort of UK based for their holidays you know where where should they go what should they do what would be your recommendation oh so I guess I mean there's a lot in Scotland (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I I guess for me like most of my personal development has been in Glencoe it's probably where like um it's where it has my heart so yeah I think you can't really go wrong in Glencoe there's like hold on let's have a think there's at least two four six eight nine Munros maybe 11 depending on where you count the limits there's kind of Munros suitable for everyone so there's like a nice a morning walk you could do one or well kind of half day half day walk or there's like the whole anarchy which is two Munros and like two kilometers of of scrambling two kilometers of scrambling (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> not, not quite all. It's not all like Phil on Scramble, but it's quite, it's quite long. It's a good, it's, it's a good like proper ridge walk scramble. Oh, Kirsty, thank you so much for coming on Tough Club Podcast and sharing more about your passions and your love for the mountains and climbing. And best of luck with our shared outdoors and the work that you're doing in that space. Absolutely amazing. Thank you so much. Hey Tribe, I hope you enjoyed the episode with Kirsty. So like I mentioned at the start, my name is Sarah Williams. I'm the host of the Tough Girl podcast and the founder of Tough Girl Challenges. So everything that we have talked about today will be available on the website at toughgirlchallenges.com. So please do go and check it out. But one of the things I wanted to do today was to leave you with the trailer for On The Outside podcast, a UK-based podcast showing diverse views on outdoors news. So enjoy. We need to talk about the outdoors. It tends to be the experts in particular sports who hold these conversations. Not just the epic stories, but the important news, the big events, and the social issues that permeate the whole of the outdoors. There just isn't a podcast out there that is covering outdoor news. Welcome to On The Outside. It's a new style podcast. On the Outside is for anyone that spends their time outdoors in the UK and wants to engage in the wider outdoor community. What we're trying to do is to widen the horizons of people and brands. Each episode, you'll hear a diverse panel of enthusiasts and experts. Everything from LGBTQ plus to different races, ethnicities, abilities and access. It's the kind of people I want to see more in the industry. And I really respect and value their opinions. As they discuss the news stories that matter to them. The conception of the athletic body image and how that looks, there is a thin body type associated with it. And I think especially trans women and men can feel particularly uncomfortable swimming early in transition. So it's just hopefully going to be a great way to get those people active. The BMC initiative that is looking to get different people's perspective and views on a survey. We'll look at everything from specific sports news. UKC did an article which spoke a lot about how climbing and disordered eating is fairly interlinked. To the social issues that shape the way we experience the outdoors. With the anniversary of George Floyd, what has been the impact of that a year on? If they're only going to say everyone's welcome here, some people won't feel welcome. If we put it in a really crass way, it's going to make these outdoors companies more money. All in a jargon and judgment-free way. It's okay to get it wrong. We're all got to learn together. And that's what's really, really important, is the learning together without fear. Our first episode is out on the 30th of July. So if you want to talk about what's happening outside, tap the follow button in your favourite podcast app.